So good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, what, what we hope will be a little series of explorations of the hidden corners of FME. And today we're starting it, uh, this new series, with a little bit of an in-depth look at an area of FME that has been under-promoted for, um, well, at least nine years. Uh, well, that is such an FME's inception. Probably. Yeah, really, it's never been promoted. So, <laughs> so that would be almost 20 years. We've never done a webinar on linear referencing. Thanks you, thank you all for being part of this historic event. Yes. Uh, the unveiling of the FME referencing and our clever title about how FME measures up. So, welcome. Um, yes, we're hoping this series. Uh, for those that are old enough to remember the X Files, this is kind of. Um, exploration into the dark corners that have been that some conspiracy has kept suppressed uh, these capabilities of FME and we're saying that the solution is out there yeah <laughs> and so if uh, if anybody's got ideas for webinar topics on that where they've been using dark corners of <laughs> FME and they think that uh, we should promote them uh, do let us know and we maybe put together a, a webinar on the FME secrets. That's right, FME un untrodden territory. So um, today we're going to be looking at linear referencing. Some of this webinar is just to introduce terminology around linear referencing and then we'll explore the various tools in FME starting easy and getting more complex. Yep. Um, and I do want to highlight uh, you're also going to get a chance to crack into seeing the power of the new FME geometry model. And I say new in quotes because that's been around since 2007, but uh, we've never really explored that uh, in much depth. And, and Mark is going to be digging into some of that today, talking about obscure things like traits and named measures and things like that. So, yeah. So I'm Dale Lutz. I'm one of the founders here at SAFE. Been around for 20 years here. And I'm Mark Stokes, Manager of Professional Services. And we got a couple of folks standing by. Uh, that isn't Dave's picture, though. No, he's hiding behind the question panel. He's I shy. He's, Dave's a bit shy. Right, we don't have a picture, we don't Dave. Have a picture of Dave. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, Dave, but uh, you are definitely uh, photogenic enough to rate a picture, and we'll try to squeeze you in next time. That's but. right. And Dan uh, Eisminger is uh, with us as well, answering questions. So, on the go to webinar panel there, um, fire away if you've got any questions or comments on. Uh, what we're presenting here today. Yes, don't hesitate to keep them busy. And at the end, we'll kind of do a roundup of those. Yeah. But now we have to really give a special shout out to our friend Knut Jetland from, and I, what do you think it is, Staten's Vague of Essen? Yes. I don't have very good Norwegian, but um, my sister in law speaks Norwegian. I should okay. have had her help. Yes. Right. But, um, but anyway, Knut has been a longtime champion of the linear referencing capabilities in FME and really most of these slides today come from talks of his. He's twice presented at FME events that I know of, at least twice, one yeah. here in Vancouver many years ago and recently at the FME days that were in Sweden uh, about a year ago. And, um, and so he's done a great job of exploring that and we're really thrilled that he was willing to give us his material for us to take as a starting point. I'm butcher, I'm afraid, so yes. I <laughs> apologize ahead of time. We have. We have had to shorten Knut's uh, presentation a bit, so we've uh, chopped up some of his slides. So we've put the reference, the FME LY um, short uh, reference there yes. to his original material. So if you want to see the unadulterated uh, version of Knut's uh, presentations, uh, uh, that's there, and you can um, then get the truth really from what uh, the we've truth had is, to chop. Yeah, up. the truth is out there. But but we should also invite Knut. He might be able to be talked into representing a revised and updated version of this at our at our uh, upcoming FME International User Conference. Yes, yeah, definitely. He could do an encore performance in June. We just went live with registration yesterday, so we'll talk more about that later. But anyway, thanks so much, Knut. Yeah, and so we're weaving in and out of uh, Knut's sort of presentation and his uh, workflow as we go. Uh, to um, see uh, the bits and pieces of LRS that he, he was using. And, and we will say as well, of course, Knut comes to this uh, problem from the view of a roads situation, but the concepts work very well for other things, particularly pipelines and other kinds of networks. Yeah. And so as we're going, Mark will be weaving in, in and out, off, off the road, onto the pipeline, and back onto the road as, uh, as the examples unfold. Okay, wow, we're going out to the polls already to try to understand our audience. So let me uh, get a sense of how you're uh, doing. So we've got uh, oh, quite a nice spread of, uh, of folks. We'll let a few more, I'd see uh, pretty much an even split. 
on users and non-users? No, across ex oh, all, okay. all the questions. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think we'll call that good, and we'll show the results. So we have almost 20% of you that aren't using FME. We always thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, hopefully you'll learn a few things today. Even if you never use FME, we hope you will have increased your understanding of this interesting and fascinating area of linear referencing. And to those of you that use FME, thanks so much. And I hope you're uh, able to enjoy the, the uh, presentation as we go along. We're not really going to give much intro material on FME. We're going to storm right in and, uh, and get into the, the problem at hand. So if you, I'll just make a mention, if you um, want to know more about FME, you should tune in tomorrow morning or sign up on our website, safe.com, for an intro webinar that, Mark, you usually give that. That's right. I usually give that. Right. Yeah. So anyway, let's introduce this fascinating world of linear referencing Yeah, systems. used in pipelines, trains, and uh, automobiles, I guess. Um, but not planes. Not planes. <laughs> um, so linear referencing, associating uh, attributes or events uh, to locations or station points uh, along a linear uh, network element um, or a route. So there's all sorts of terminology out there in terms of uh, how people refer to these uh, events and uh, network linear elements or, or routes. Uh, so an example here from uh, Knut's uh, presentation is uh, a simple example of a fence that runs along the side of a road, and uh, so you can use the road geometry as the mark, as the sort of the basis for where that fence sits, and then you can have um, uh, the fence as an event, and uh, that fence is described as being so many kilometers uh, or miles, depending on the units you're using, uh, along the road from 1.8 kilometers to. Uh, well, no, two kilometers to 2.8 kilometers or whatever the mile markers are along that road. So that's the, the reasoning for using uh, LRS systems is to uh, identify um, events as uh, features along the length of a road rather than with an exact uh, coordinate. So that way I guess if the road gets uh, updated a little bit or becomes more accurately represented, the fence comes along for the ride. That's right. And that's exactly. the whole point. Yeah. And so that, yeah, that gets us into this idea that you have one geometry and then uh, a series of other tables that kind of lay against that geometry to tell us where things are beginning and ending. That's right, yeah. So in a traditional sense, like in a traditional GIS sense uh, or a segmented geometry, you might refer to it as that, um, the attributes are attached to each uh, piece of the geometry. And uh, so as attributes change, you might have to snip up the geometry because uh, if uh, on this uh, the first uh, L, uh, road element here the, with the ID 1, the red element, um, if the speed limit there is changed halfway along that element, we'd have to snip that in, in two, two pieces and adjust the attributes on that element, the speed uh, to maybe uh, 70 kilometers along the latter part of that and then the width might stay the same or something. And so there's a lot of uh, a geometry work goes on um, when you change some of the attribution on um, on one of those segments. Right, so just to be very clear, in an old-fashioned shape file in that previous slide, I would have had three features, yeah. and they would each have had different combinations of those two attributes. But a linear referencing approach is what I guess you've got going here. Yeah, and again, these this is uh, one of Newt's examples. So this is uh, that same data represented in a different uh, way. So the orange uh, line here represents the actual road element. So we've uh, uh, joined together all the individual segments into a single road element. And then the actual attribution on that road element is uh, distributed along the road as events. Uh, so we've got two types of events in this case, the speed limit in that table and the road width. Uh, each event has its own separate ID. Each uh, event is associated with the network linear element or the route. Um, that's uh, that they're actually attached to, and the event is marked as a from to distance along that uh, particular route. And so uh, we can have a look at that in a uh, little FM Universal Viewer. So here's a similar example that uh, we built up that uh, kind of represents the same kind of information that we had there in the universe in the Data Inspector. Uh, so we've got three segments here. In the table view here, we can see each of those uh, three segments. Um, they've got uh, a, a width and a speed attached to them. 
And as we click down through there, you can see each segment is represented um, with its uh, attributes on them. And so going to a more um, event-based, uh, uh, linear referencing-based model, we would only have a single geometry there. So that would be the single geometry. And then each of the sets of attributes would, we have would be represented as a separate table um, with a from to event there. So the um, speed in this case goes at 70 kilometers from the zero uh, marker on that uh, line here, which is uh, here uh, at the left hand side uh, to about 66% uh, of the line length. So I'm using a percent measure in this case, not a, a, a distance measure. And then the speed from 50 would be from the 66% to 100% of that uh, road length there. Mm -hmm. yeah, somewhere in, in some sunny Vancouver, I guess. Yes, uh, Sean on a nice uh, Esri base map. So thanks to our friends at Esri for uh, providing ArcGIS online base maps to FME users that have ArcGIS yeah, as, uh, right. on their desktops. Oh, I've come up with the wrong... Uh, View there. That's the one we want. Okay. Yes. So that's the two models shown there, and so now the fun begins in starting to work with all that. That's right, and of course, um, that's what uh, where we think FME can fit in is moving your models between, uh, or part of it, moving your models between one or the other. And a big part of the uh, workflow that Knut had is actually creating these events uh, in the first place. So sometimes that's a challenge. You actually need to identify what the events are and what they're from to... Um, For example, if, you, if somebody went out and got a point where the fence starts, yeah, then you, right. you know, okay, wait a minute, the fence started at this location. Now let's figure out what that measure is and start setting up our events. That's right. Okay, wow. So now we find out if, how many people have actually discovered this hidden corner of FME. And uh, let's see see what they uh, say. So we're asking, have you used FME for linear referencing? And 100% so far have said, not yet convince me. So uh, come on, Knut, Knut needs to at least vote. <laughs> <laughs> We'd expect at least one. Whoa, OK. So uh, this is sort of what happens when you put functionality in and never tell anybody about it, I guess. Uh, there's a good lesson here. We got a very good voter turnout. And uh, I'm going to just let it go a wee bit longer. But um, yeah, definitely this is proving that this is a hidden corner okay. of FME. So I'm going to close the poll. And are you ready to see these shocking results? Here they are. 70% um, say they need to be convinced. Uh, okay. uh, they've never done it. 22% um, are using other tools. And hopefully you'll chat and tell us what you're doing. And we should say that FME is not the be all and end all in your referencing thing. But it's useful, like all things FME, for converting between different representations and bringing the linear referencing between different formats, which may or may not have the, the support you want. Yeah, and there's also the display side of this problem as well, which FME doesn't really get into. So there's right. the tools for displaying these event yes. based models. Yes, uh, exactly. Um, and so we're thinking really that FME fits into the data restructuring side of it, our traditional yeah. kind of arena, getting the data into the right structure, and then uh, using the appropriate tools to display these uh, LRS models. Right, so we're kind of early on the front end of the problem or way late on the back end. Yeah. So uh, never never the glory boys in the middle. So anyway, thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, definitely uh, some uh, unexplored territory here That's today. Right. OK, well, let's just have a quick look at a, um, a quick example of uh, that. So I've got. Uh, um, I won't start there. I think I'll start with a blank uh, canvas. Uh, oh, no, we're starting here. It's pretty blank, so, Mark. Yeah, this is pretty blank. <laughs> so um, so what we've got here is, uh, uh, no, that's not uh, where I'm going to start. I'm going to start. Uh, you are going to go blank. I'm going to go blank, yeah. So you're going to generate, OK. Yeah, we're going to start from a, a simple shape file with those little examples that we have uh, in our um, okay, data so set. So we've got those source segmented models. So this is the three segments of data that we had uh, earlier in the viewer okay. there. Yeah. Uh, and we could uh, pop that up if we wanted to. And then we're just going to go out to shape again. Uh, just on the output side, we'll put a, an output uh, directory there somewhere. So this is just really building a very simple um, 
just to illustrate actually more some of the uh, interesting geometries and so on that we have uh, in uh, FME. So we could uh, just inspect that from scratch again. So we've got our three segments there that each right. has the speed and the road width uh, sitting on it. All right. And so we call uh, that a segmented view. That's a segmented view, yeah. So let's just play around with some of the geometry here. So we've got a, a thing called the geometry property setter. Um, GPS would have got it. GPS would have got it. Yeah, maybe that's uh, good. So this is a tool that allows us to set some of the, uh, these hidden uh, geometry properties that uh, we've been adding to the geometry structures of FME. Um, and in this case, what I'm going to do is add some traits. And so traits are attributes that are attached to the individual geometry. So we could, uh, in this case, attach the uh, okay. speed and the ID of those uh, segments, for example, and uh, just attach those. And then we'll just carry on. We'll have a look at the results in a little bit uh, later. And then what we can do is uh, join these uh, line segments together. Right, because you had three. I had three. Now so you're going to have string one. string them together. And I'm going to just string them together by the street name, because they do all have this right. a street name. Okay. They have different IDs. Okay. And uh, one of the things about the line joiner, it only preserves the attribution that is common to each uh, uh -huh. uh, element. And so in this case, it's only going to preserve so the street So you're going to show us what's going to happen here. Yeah. So we can preserve uh, that. And then along the way, what we can do is we can um, generate a, a measure here. So we can use the measure generator to uh, generate the measure. And we have got. Uh, um, it's going to generate measures based on length. Yeah. Um, now, of course, you can put in a function here. So some of this is some of the uh, uh, new tools that we've got in here. So we could actually make Ooh. this um, a function of uh, something. Uh, so what we could do is uh, just to make this a percent measure. So we could make that, say, multiply by 100% of... Um, you must have to say an asterisk. You must have to say an asterisk there. I've never seen this done before, though. Um, and then we've got some functions in here that we can use, which is the line length. And so we're going to get a percentage of the, the length. OK, of so instead of result there. Ah. OK, so this would give us a percent measure instead of a linear distance measure. And of course, if you wanted your measures to be in kilometers and the unit of your coordinate system yes. is sitting in uh, meters or something, you could have a, an equivalent. Now, now that name business, you can leave it blank, it's OK? Or? Yeah, because if you want it to go out to a shape, um, a shape would only accept. Um, oh, and then you've got to say polyline M. You need to say a polyline M out here. Yes. OK. So that's at the end here, we'll stick an inspector just to speed things up a bit. Because, yeah, it's going to be a bit uh, interesting to start looking at these. Uh, this. Yeah, so we've <clears throat> strung together those uh, uh, pieces, and now uh, looking over here, what we have is uh, we've still got that street name, but here's some of the uh, more interesting uh, parts of the geometry. So what we've preserved is uh, individual paths on that uh, geometry. So we still have three individual geometries, which we now call a path. Um, and uh, each of those uh, pieces of the geometry, which are all strung together as a um, multi-part geometry, as it were, have maintained their attributes uh, here as the geometry traits, which right. you can pull back um, later on if you want to use them. And of course, each of the geometries here uh, have um, their measure stuck on them. And so the next piece of the geometry has uh, these uh, measures along here. So, um, so we can preserve quite a lot of information at the geometry level now, which is really um, useful. And in other areas, we found that uh, this idea of a path is very useful because when you string together lines that have measures on them, uh, the, the two points that join together, you can often um, not really predict what, uh, which of the two measure values are going to be um, oh. knocked off the, uh, uh, the, the, the point, the vertex, as it merges there. But by preserving paths, you can actually have measures that might represent different values at the vertices, but they don't get uh, uh, knocked off. Now, the thing is, this model that you're showing is the FME internal model, and I'm pretty darn sure that in shape files we can't store traits, for example. That's right. We so, can't store a path either. Right. So, so it's going to get dumbed down on the way yeah, out. Yeah. But inside of FME, 
a lot of knowledge can be preserved, which maybe you dig out later to do something with. So this idea of pushing information down onto the geometry, doing some geometric operations, then popping back out and working with it is now possible. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is a big step forward, particularly the structure of our measures here um, is a big improvement in our enhanced geometry. I suspect that, uh, looking at some of Newt's examples, I suspect that when he started his project, uh, he was starting that at a time when our measures were actually represented as list attributes. Yes. And so that was very limiting. So uh, when you snip up those uh, geometries that you've built, the lists don't get snipped up with them. And um, so uh, it's, uh, uh, I think this is going to really change the way that people work uh, with um, FME. Oh, wow. Okay. That was our old poll. Right. I was scared I'd do a poll again <laughs> right away. But this is dangerous. There's a moose crossing there. That's right. So this is um, just an introduction to the example that uh, Knut put together here. Um, so what he was doing is identifying road sections where there were um, wildlife accidents. I guess they have uh, uh, moose uh, up there. Um, and then they wanted to correlate to that to where there might be street lights on these uh, more rural routes and see um, whether there was a correlation. So the input geometry that he had in his example were the road geometries. Um, and then tables with these, um, uh, this information about the traffic accidents and the street light -like locations. He was also, toward, towards the tail end there, he was uh, relating that to the amount of traffic as well. Uh, on these uh, road elements. So, so that's basically the story that he's put together and we were loosely following in, the, in our webinar today. There's a lot of moose in Newfoundland. I think, do we have somebody uh, from Newfoundland on the call today? I didn't see anybody, but uh, yeah. Well, originally that was one of the customers though that yeah, we did some yeah, work with, so roads, they yeah. well could, maybe that's the pattern. If you have moose to deal with, <laughs> you need to get LRS going. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so this is just a list of some of the common tasks. We're really just putting this in here for reference. Um, all these uh, slides will be made available uh, on the website, and you'll get a, a link to that in the follow-up email. So this is just there as a sort of a reference, but um, just some of the tasks that you can go through. Cardinal orientation now, Mark, we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with how the next pope is chosen. No, no okay. nor, how, nor how he's choosing the next round of cardinals, which happens pretty soon. Actually. Yes, right. So this has nothing to do with that, but yeah. you are going to explain what that is? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, creating uh, network linear uh, elements or routes, which are the, you know, the actual uh, road segments all strung together. Um, adding measures to network linear elements. Uh, creating event tables from some geometry. Um, doing some asset management adding or stationing points, so adding LRS values to assets that you might have. Um, moving uh, network elements and event models on an LRS model uh, to segments. And I think in a visual sense, that's what people kind of refer to dynamic se segmentation. So that's not really part of FME because um, we don't do that as dynamically, I guess, as a, um, a visualization tool. Uh, the reverse, taking a segmented model and going to an LRS model. And then we'll talk briefly about uh, back and ahead measures as the geometry does change. So FME is a toolkit in this area. There's no kind of like one place where you just go and say, here, let's create uh, some LRS thing. So this is the list of the many transformers that we uh, commonly use in this arena. And so some of these have been used by Knut in his example. Some we used in the original um, NRCAN and Network uh, and Newfoundland Roads examples. Um, and so we're going to, yes, so, so Dale Snipper, uh, the length to point calculator tools sort of uh, in, in a sort of a, a, a loose category called uh, LRS transformers or linear referencing transformers, uh, they're there. And then a bunch of ad hoc transformers, the line join are very important in this area, we've already seen that. Uh, neighbor finder used for sort of the asset management and stationing, um, uh, line on line overlay I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, we had a quick look at paths already. And then there is some data joining going on. Uh, so you can use things like the feature merger, SQL executor, and uh, Knut was uh, using, making clever use of the inline query uh, in, this, uh, in his uh, workflow. So that was uh, pretty uh, good. Because really, the, a lot of these LRS things are a clever combination of a relational model yeah. and a geometry model. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so that's why these database things tend to get tangled in when you're doing something clever. That's right. Um, and I will mention now, like uh, we've already had a quick uh, example there, that the complication in LRS in FME, I think, comes from the special cases. So yes. And the problem does become, uh, the workflows become more com complex with those special cases, one of them being uh, linear rings or, or cul-de-sacs. So when you have to deal with uh, those, you have to sort of do slightly different uh, flavors of line joining, and they can uh, complicate your workflows a little bit. And actually, we had already one of the customers has written in and said that um, one thing that stumbles them up with FME and linear referencing is when they have aggregates. Yes. So if you have a multi-part feature, um, we need to do some work there, and I would definitely want to follow up afterwards to find out what is the right way to deal with measures when you have something that consists of five disjoint parts. Yeah, that's right. And so that's a you know that's what Mark's getting at these special cases or these sort of odd corner cases. It's one thing to chop up the street in front of your house, but it's another when you have these other things. So that's great to get yeah, definitely, into that. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, prerequisites for success. We're not going to uh, go into this, but of course, uh, getting your data clean and then having even cleaner data than it was after you cleaned it is a really good way to start. You know, having a good solid network, uh, making sure the segments are properly noted and all connect. Um, so there are some handy transformers around there for that uh, snapper intersector topology building. And the network topology calculator is a useful transformer for just having a look at your network and seeing if there are elements that uh, or segments that don't join in on the network fun. Right. So I remember when we did a world tour a year or two ago, Mark, you had an example like this where you fed a network in there and you're hoping to get one network one, identified. That's right. That means everything connects and if yeah. three things come out then you've got a problem because it means you just can't get there from exactly. here. Exactly, yeah. So and of course, that might be correct if there's some private roads or something, but um, it's, uh, it's worthy of uh, it's worthy of investigation yes. and inspection. Very good. So we just had a, already had a quick look at some of these uh, geometry structures that we've been adding to FME, and so this is a summary uh, of those. So uh, measures, which uh, in older versions of FME used to be represented as attribute lists, so that was kind of uh, awkward. So when you're looking at uh, data in the feature information window in Inspector, you can expand on these and see measures. You can have multiple measures in FME, and you can give the measures names. Um, and so we've just got one measure here, which is just called the default uh, one. Uh, so it's a, basically an unnamed measure, and uh, that's what that's representing. And measures can represent anything, so they don't have to be particularly tied to the units of the coordinate system you're working in. So um, they could the measures could be in miles or kilometers, or in my case here, I'm using percent uh, measures. Uh, paths are a newish geometry structure that we've introduced to FME, sometimes called chains, depending on what uh, um, GIS system you're using. So it's a special form of an aggregate, really, yes. in the sense that it's uh, multi-part geometry that has been strung together, and the order of the how that is strung together um, is important. It's basically there's no gaps in it. That's right, yeah. And then uh, uh, geometry traits, uh, these are the attributes that are actually hanging on each independent part of the geometry, and so they are a good way of preserving certain information, so as you blend data together into uh, network linear elements or roots, and then expand those back again, uh, in your workflow, you can sort of preserve uh, uh, attribution on each individual geometry part, which is uh, sometimes really And useful. again, that's really just an FME invention because, to my knowledge, the only format that can preserve that today is FFS. Yeah. And so it's just useful in the middle of a transformation to keep track of things and then you need to pop it back out again if you were really wanting to preserve that uh, in an output format. Well, I'm sure Don would be proud of saying there's something in XML that has something I, There's got to be a way in XML. <laughs> You've got to think there would be. Uh, and then something else that we're not going to uh, touch on today, but uh, is all part of that uh, new geometry structure, is the ability to have uh, the idea of multiple named geometries uh, in FME. Um, and so, you know, some of the GIS systems support multi multiple spatial columns, Oracle, Small World, and so we can now name those geometries so it's easier to identify what 
column, spatial column they originated in or, or are you going to write them to? You know, we just had a question come in asking, is there any practical limit to how many pieces you can have in a path or how many traits you can have? And the answer is there is. It's only limited by your imagination and I your memory. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's not, nothing in FME. So you, and we have seen definitely chains and paths that have huge numbers of, yeah. of parts. Yeah. Um, on the trait side, it's only uh, inside FME, so it's only how devious we want to be. Uh, that's kind of been the test of that. But uh, underneath, I know from the implementation, there's no practical limit. Yeah, I mean, it is really just a, mul a multi-part geometry. So we've seen very huge aggregate geometries in FME, so yes. I wouldn't see why there would be a limitation like, on Like a million path. pieces, really. Yeah. So just touching on cardinal orientation, this seems to be something that people need to do. It's relatively straightforward to do in FME. You know, all the routes have to sort of point more or less in the right direction. So you have to string together all your segments, uh, figure out where the endpoints of that uh, route are, and then um, and then you can use the orienter transformer to flip the orientation of that uh, route to meet to make sure that it's, they are all pointing more or less in uh, the same direction. And it seems most conventions, although probably different in the, um, uh, the lower half of the hemisphere, seems to be going from lower left to top right, uh, or south to north and west to east, more or less. Okay. Right, so the orienter normally worked with polygons, and you tell it right-hand rule or left-hand rule, but yeah. you can also use it just to flip just to lines. Flip. So you have to figure out what direction that is. So in this case here, we're using the coordinate extractor to pick out the first and last coordinates of the, the network linear element, and then just testing the values to make sure that they're in the right direction. Right. Okay, so back to Knut's example. Um, and his sort of general over, over, overall workflow. So what he was doing is uh, looking at these uh, accident events. So one of the steps he had to do, which I thought was interesting, was he actually had to create the events from the individual geometry. So he had these uh, individual accident points and the individual light um, locations, or the locations of the lights. And what he really wanted was to create a linear event for a region of where those um, incidents or those events occur. So in case of the accident points, he buffered those, took the individual points, buffered them, and then dissolved those overlapping buffers to create more of a linear feature. We'll have a look at that. So that was kind of interesting. And then he worked with those um, uh, network linear elements to and those uh, now sort of more linearized events to merge them together to form uh, geometry segments. Um, and then he calculated the linear reference for each of those events, uh, and then overlaid the accidents and the light sections, uh, street lit sections. So that's a kind of a blending of these events, um, and then calculating the geometry for each uh, accident or the street light section. So quite a lot of steps there. I think in his actual production workflow, I think I'm correct in saying that's actually probably separate workflows, but then he blended it all together into a single um, huge workspace for his uh, kind of presentation purposes. Right. So this was his, uh, the first step uh, here that he had, which was essentially creating the events as I see it. So I think he termed it some, slightly something differently, but as I was walking through this and trying to understand his workflow, um, th that's how I kind of interpret it. Uh, so he's trying to create the event geometries for the, um, the lights and for the accidents. And so for the accidents, for example, what he's done is he buffers each of those accident points and then um, uh, does a dissolve between the overlapping buffers. And uh, the next step then is to uh, create a linear um, event that represents sort of the center line really of that uh, buffer. And so this is some of the um, uh, transformers that he was using here. The asterisk ones are the ones he actually used in his workflow. Um, and so he was using the inline querier to do uh, nifty joins between uh, the actual events, the accident events, and the routes that he has in his road model. Right. What I'll mention for those that don't know, the inline querier is a relatively new thing in FME that creates a database on the fly. So you take data that wasn't in a database, throw it into, and then a temporary one, and then you can execute arbitrary SQL statements against that. Yeah. <clears throat> so again, that's why, as I mentioned, many of these LRS problems turn into interesting relational problems 
combined with the geometry. And so that's what he did as a starting point. Here. That's right. Yeah. And so it's a, a feature merger is similar to that, except it just does a very simple join. And so the inline query is a really souped up version of the feature merger where you can do really interesting and complex uh, SQL multi-way uh, joins too. Multi-way joins. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can have multiple joins. The snipper, my favorite one. Snipper, so that uh, allows you to break up uh, um, linear features based on the distance along that feature. So uh, that's how you come up with uh, those individual uh, line segments. Um, in the work that I've been doing in LRS, we use the line on line overlayer a lot to merge together overlapping segments. Um, and so that's one way of doing that. that. That's the way to get all the small pieces. Basically, it'll be broken every time anything that's changed. Right. Yeah. So you and take all these separate segmented ones and slam them down into one, uh, basically collapse them into one uh, segmented chopped up thing. That's right. And blending all the attributes. So Along that's way. one way if you've got different uh, multiple events, Yes. that's a way of blending those events together into segments. We call it the blender. We should do, yes. <laughs> a <Yeah>. Vitamixer. <laughs> uh, and then line joiner allows you to take segments that have the same event characteristics and uh, string them together into longer segments as well. So, um, so that's uh, kind of that. Uh, step you can there. line on line overlay and then join it all back up. You yeah. get back where you started. Yeah. <laughs> And then sort of at the next point there, when you've got these events, is to take that event geometry and convert it more into uh, an LRS kind of uh, model. And uh, so in this case here, well, in Knut's example, he didn't really uh, have to do some of these steps. So the first of these steps might be actually to create your network linear elements in the first place. And so their key transformers there are the line joiner and the measure generator. Uh, so they're, they're, those are how you actually create the main route in the first place. And then sort of for, for different types of features, you might uh, use different tools. So if you're creating linear events, the line joiner where you can string segments together, a line on line overlayer again used for merging segments if you need to, um, and then uh, the measure extractor will allow you to recover the from two measures at the end of those events. Uh, Knut actually took a slightly different path, which I thought was interesting and uh, still very effective. What he did is actually broke down the individual segments um, that he had built into individual points, used the neighbor finders to match those points to his network linear elements, and then use the length to point calculator to find the measures for each of those points. And then um, I did have a look at uh, his workflow, but I didn't really fully figure out the underlying um, methodology. But he then used the lists he had built up, the attribute lists, uh, to actually d determine what the end uh, from to measure um, was on, on that actual event geometry. So that's how he was building his event geometry. It's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. So um, a lot of uh, detail there. So those are, again, kind of a reference set of uh, transformers that you can use for creating event, taking event geometries and attaching them to your uh, LRS. One, one thing that uh, Knut just wrote in and said that he tends to try to avoid line-on-line -line overlays and instead use snipping yeah. because when he does line-on-line -line overlays, if the stuff has a little bit of accuracy problems, you end up with little tiny shards. Yeah. Yeah. And so that can be an issue. That's I will right. mention that the work we're doing in FME 2014 around um, black hole intersections may reduce the probability of getting shards in the future. That's so, but, but a good point, Knut, and... Um, something to be aware of. So I guess instead of doing line-on-line -line overlay, he would go and do snipping, which um, is always yeah. a favorite of mine. That's right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but that does come back to our thing. Clean geometry is, yes. uh, really helps it's the key. whole process. Uh, yeah. So just in summary here, just to recap, so uh, the way that these accident uh, models were built up is um, the individual accident points uh, were recorded buffered and then dissolve the um, uh, sort of the buffered uh, areas and then that uh, sort of area now converted into an, um, an event kind of model. So this would be the geometry representation of that 
event along the route there. And that's yeah. that's done with a line on area overlay. Uh, Wouldn't you? You take the uh, area and no, the... he was. That's where he was using the chopper, and in, in in his case, he used the chopper to create the individual points along here. And, okay. And the neighbor finder to attach. Oh, them the neighbor to the, finder. Got to it. Attach them to the actual geometry of the of the full route. Yes, yeah. I see. Yeah. Many ways to skin the cat, so to speak. And I know I'm summarizing this in a really <laughs> rapid way, so that's uh, um, have a look at his uh, major presentation to see that. Here we go. We okay, so this. now what he has is uh, a couple of event uh, tables or sets of events. He's got the accident sections and his uh, street lights, and so they need to be blended together, sort of more for um, I think analysis purposes. So. Typically, you would probably keep in a in a traditional LRS view. You would keep these separate because you would have an event table now for your accident sections, and you'd have an event table for your street lights. Um, and but for analysis purposes, he wants to see how those overlap so that he can display those. And so they all need to be overlaid on on each other. Um, and again, he was using the inline query. I think uh, if my jo if the geometry was clean, uh, you could possibly get away with the line on line overlay to merge these segments. And so what he did is he sort of came together, uh, came up with a blended event model that showed the segments that had uh, common accidents and common. So, uh, so this is the segmented events. model, basically. Essentially, it is a, a representation of a segment. And so in our in our shape file, we'd have six features now. Yeah, that's right. And then the results of that um, model really are, um, I mean, that was the whole point of his analysis, is to see more visually where these uh, um, events occur and how they overlap. So to see where areas are that have uh, street lights. So this one on the sort of the right-hand side of his map here are accident sections that have no street lights. Um, and then... Uh, um, the other one here, I guess, this is an accident section that does have some street lights. So there's other some other um, thing going on there where the moose are kind of crossing at that uh, particular section there. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so for an unadulterated uh, view of that, yes, yes. <laughs> again, there's the the uh, the short uh, path to that, and you can have a look at his um, full presentation if you want to get a better. Uh, overview of uh, understanding of what he was doing there. So you're going to go and show us how it's done in a very uh, restricted Yeah, I was going to bring up a, uh, a workspace and just have a look at uh, how now, we could do that. One thing they did ask uh, the online folks like you to maximize there. Oh, okay. And then I might and get you to in. zoom in yeah. a tad. Okay. Just crank that zoomer over yeah, to... Let's uh, go and find uh, the workspace. So what we're going to do is have a look at... Uh, not yeah. that one. No. Um, a segment uh, yeah, linear referencing. Oh, let's go to the directory and actually we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> it must be. Uh, Here we go. This is the one we were going to look at. So let's uh, zoom her in. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Because we haven't done this one yet, I know. Yeah. So zoom her into, say, 120 or 150. Just grab the slider there. There. Whoa. Okay. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So this would be an example of going from an LRS event model out to the um, a more segmented view of your data. So you got some spreadsheets there. Can we take I've a got a couple of spreadsheets here that uh, we can have a look at. Um, actually, I think I've already got those uh, up in the data inspector. So here is okay. this is our spreadsheet here. So this is they're just the small segments here that we had before that we were looking at. So that's the speed uh, and the width uh, that we have there. Um, and then this is the actual street uh, uh, element that uh, we're reading in here. So what we're going to do is split this up uh, into the individual segments based on the speed and the uh, the width that we have uh, there. We seem to have lost that. There we go. All right. And so then what, you're going to bring those all together. So I'm just throwing them into the, the feature merger, just uh, merging them together by the uh, LRS uh, ID that we have on each of the features. So obviously each event has to be associated with a network linear element. So uh, that's what the feature merger is doing. 
Um, that's just a simple join. In some cases, it might be more sophisticated joins that you're doing, which was certainly the case in Knut's um, yes. example. So he was using the uh, inline query or any of the other database tools if this were real database data. So what you're doing is for all of those spreadsheet records, they're going to end up coming out of here with um, the geometry of their whole guy they refer that's to. That's correct, yeah. And I think that's one of the options we've got on the feature merger here is the feature merge type, yet we want to merge on the geometry from the uh, incoming supplier feature. Right, well. you're just pulling that across. Yeah. So we're going to end up with a whole bunch of records coming out of there, and then finally we get to do some sniffing. That's right. And so we have the complete geometry of the whole road attached to these events, and we have the from to values for each event. Those are attributes on that event. And so now what we can do is we can snip that geometry down to the individual uh, piece of the event there. Yes. And then, again, my preference, uh, if you can get away with it, use the line on line overlay to stack all of these pieces uh, up together um, and uh, merge them together and blend together their uh, attributes. And uh, we should see there that uh, all those attributes get merged together, the from twos the width and the speed from the two separate incoming yes. events get blended together and we get uh, a complete uh, merged uh, model there. And then in this case, just because we are going out to uh, a simple shape model, I'm dropping the measures and I'm dropping uh, the third dimension. That's uh, So Mark, before that. you run, oh, he's oh. going to run. Okay, we're going to run it all and then I'm going to want to run this in slow motion. Okay. <laughs> so that's, okay, so we ran it. And one of the things to always analyze, let's slide it over to the left is it's useful to always look at the numbers along here. So four things, two of each came in at the requester, and sure enough, four came out into our snipper, and then we snipped, and now when you collapse it all down, only three came out That's right. as yep. well. But I just wanted to show, and I'll drive here, and I did, Mark doesn't even know what I'm doing here. I want to take a look. We're going to use an inspection point here. We'll add one so we can watch, and um, I'll add one here as well. And that's just a way of showing how we can kind of take a look at what's going to happen here. So I'm going to run with inspection, and with any luck, there it is. So we can see the, the feature that came out of here um, is just a straight piece of line, and um, this one has our two and our from, it goes zero to 66. Yep, yep. And so, and right now though, and it's, it's one of the speed events. Right now you can kind of see it's got four points and it's got these coordinates, and if I'm the least bit lucky, it got cut. You see, now there's fewer. It, it still looks the same length because it's um, zoomed in the same way. That's but right. then we can, and so we can step through and watch what happens here to each of these, and watch as they all get cut. And so sometimes this is a useful way to understand what's happening point by point. So there it is in slow motion. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And um, did you want to look at that output or not, Mark? Oh, we've seen that before. Okay, so you don't need yeah. to see that. Okay, yeah. so I'll just slide this fell out of the way a little bit, and off you go. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. No, that's great. But when it's for things like this where it's useful to kind of watch what's happening piece by piece, it might be helpful. Okay. All right. So moving on to just a slightly yes. different yes. Uh, example. This is something that we did with uh, a proof of concept with Fred Judson at the uh, Ohio DOT. So um, coming back across the Atlantic. Um, and so this was, a, I think, a fairly, probably a fairly typical case. Uh, he had some contractors go out uh, and uh, actually record the location of some of their assets, light, uh, light posts, or different lighting um, uh, assets in this case. Uh, so part of the exercise was just some simple data cleanup. You can see here some really odd long values that are presented as part of the spreadsheets that they received from these contractor reports and then all the details of the, the type of uh, lighting fixture that uh, they're measuring on. That was all done in Excel. So some typical data cleanup, but just the simplest dating, uh, converting the DMS lat long values uh, to a decimal degree so that we can use it as a geometry and so on. So uh, that was one part of the uh, uh, exercise there. And then all that contractor data w was eventually loaded into a SQL Server spatial database. All well, that was the plan. And then this is assigning, this is kind of a stationing point kind of exercise or assigning um, mile markers to assets. 
And so the dots here on the screen are the uh, light fixtures along the road network. Uh, the road network was already built, so they already had their LRS uh, system built together. And so what we were doing here is helping him actually attach the linear referencing value, i.e. the measure, um, to each of these uh, mileposts. And so uh, these are the actual mileposts that got attached to the different uh, um, features. And the, that would be using the neighbor finder predominantly, and that also gives you the offset distance. And so yes. um, in some cases, people do have measures that are the uh, um, offset as well. So you can uh, include the offset distance as a measure or as part of the uh, event table if you want to. So that's uh, what uh, they were doing there. So we could have just a quick look at that uh, example. I wonder if I can yeah. I'll just uh, get rid of that while we get the workspace up. See, someone uh, asked if we can set individual measures, and there are things, this is related to that, but there's also a transformer called the measure setter that actually lets you go and poke an individual measure at a vertex as well. That's right, yeah. You can, uh, in some cases, you may use stuff like that. That's right. Uh, we've used that before in some other tools where you're not using measures for sort of non-conventional purposes, keeping track of endpoints or where transitions occurred. Uh, you can poke a value on, onto the geometry like that, and then recover it back in the same way. Yes. So we built a custom transformer in this case to do this work. Um, a little bit uh, more complicated than maybe we would have liked to, but the yes. core parts of this uh, work were the neighbor finder. And so what we're doing here is, again, uh, taking the, the line work, and that's coming in basically as the candidate, and we're attaching that uh, um, network linear element to the base feature, which is each light fixture or each asset that you're, you're trying to work with. And uh, what we're doing here is we're extracting the geometry of each uh, um, line and preserving it as an attribute so that we can then go on to snip it and figure out where yes. along the line so, that particular So basically is. the the linear geometry is going to end up on those points. It's a lot like that previous example that you had Mark where we had the Excel spreadsheet and we were bringing the lines onto the spreadsheet rows. In this case we're bringing the lines onto the points and along the way having figured out distances that's what the neighbor finder will have done and then we can use those distances together with the length to point calculator, which is um, kind of truncated point, right yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, let's zoom this in a little bit for the folks at home. Yeah. Um, so the length to point calculator, we don't want to, yeah, that's, that's great. You can't uh, emphasize uh, the snipper enough, because there he is. <laughs> and so um, we get that length, and then once we have these lengths, based on how close, or the, the, the projection of the um, asset point onto the onto line, the line. That's right. now we get that exact X and Y and now we can go with our friend the snipper, snipper. having given him a length because the snipper wants a length. Yes. So we need to get a length by the length of the point calculator. So the length point calculator and the snipper are really best buddies. And then because actually we just want the end point of the line, that's what we're doing. So we extract the measure from the end point of that line. So this is the reverse of what that person yes. is asking about. Yes. We can say which particular measure do we want. Uh, I want to recover an individual vertex, in this case minus one, meaning that that's the end of the line. Um, and uh, so that gives us back the measure, and uh, that goes back onto the point geometry for that uh, asset. Yes. Um, so that was uh, uh, kind of a good example of that, and a more traditional, I guess a bit more of a traditional. So you got a whole bunch of stuff coming in here. Are those, uh, all these are... These the are all the different uh, tables with the different uh, light kind of assets, the individual A whole poles, bunch of assets. Navigation type, uh, signage, I guess, so you, light towers. You combine all those assets, throw them in the blender, out they come, and then you split them back and out split again. Them out into, into different tables. Very nice yeah. workflow. Yeah. So... Uh, um, that's a good example there, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, now we're finishing up with this crazy stuff. Yeah, something we haven't played around here very much in. Um, and so this is the issue of uh, back ahead uh, measures. So the, the reason people move to uh, LRS uh, kind of data sets is that if the event changes in some way, i.e. you change the 
the range of the speed limit or something, um, you don't have to change the geometry. You just change that event table and that sort of riffles through the whole system. But the problem does arise is what actually if you, happens if you change the geometry on the feature. So we did do uh, something similar to this with some pipeline uh, information fairly recently. Uh, this is kind of an example of a road network. So what happens if the road network actually is, uh, is changed in some way? So the black and gray there, the dashed lines, are the original road network. And they've changed the intersection there with the blue. And so now um, they want to uh, have to readjust all the measures. And what, they, what typically people don't want to do is to adjust the measures for that whole route. And so they have this idea of back ahead. So where that actual uh, change in length occurred, the new measures are added. So we started off at 34.03 uh, miles or kilometers. Um, and then the new measure along this extended piece of road that goes to 34.13 on the blue there. And where it comes back to the original road, uh, the new measure is 34.3, but the old measure is 34.3. Uh, two, five. And so they have this kind of back ahead, back equation in this case, where at this, where it joins back to the original road again, the old measures just uh, continue along. And uh, so that we know that uh, through this back equation, the root length has been, the root has been lengthened by, uh, in this case, point uh, zero. And the same thing happens in pipelines. If there's, uh, heaven forbid, a little bit of a leak, then they yeah. just duck around that with some new pipe. Now they've got to have these adjustments in That's there. That's right. And so and these end up being stored in various tables along with the, like yeah. as companions, basically. And of course, in, the, in terms of a road network, it's so that down here along the black part of this uh, line, they don't have to go and repaint uh, all. Uh, all, the mile this, all the mile markers that they might be there. I'm not quite sure whether if you actually have a sign like this on the road that says you can go ahead <laughs> four miles and back 4.8, whether that means anything to the average journey. It feels like a rip in the space-time <laughs> continuum. Right. But, uh, um, but anyway, we would, uh, that's an area that we haven't played that much in. Um, we know that it is a, a problem area for people. We did just do a bit of a workflow for a pipeline company just recently, so that's um, uh, an area that we, um, we have started to experiment with, with, but if you have some other problems that you think um, involve the back ahead measures, then uh, let us know and we could uh, possibly improve the product there on that front. Yes. So I think we're ready for our last poll. We're almost out of time, but um, now that you've seen all this stuff, and I know we've skimmed across a lot of it. Uh, but hopefully piqued your interest and uh, given you some proof points that this can be done and may be productive in some cases. Uh, let us know what you, what you think about the future now that you've seen all this. So you've got a few choices there. What might you do? Um, <laughs> we gave you a nice one that, boy golly, if you ever had to do some LRS, you'd sure use FME, but you don't have any. <laughs> so um, we know that uh, not everybody begins and ends their day doing LRS. So um, there you go. And so we'll let it go just a tiny bit more. Uh, there's a few more poll results coming in. Thanks so much. And then uh, I got to actually, Mark, if you want to pop up a web browser, I got something we want to show folks in a second um, when we end the poll here uh, from one of our, you yeah, just pop up a web browser of some kind. OK, we'll close the poll there. And we'll share the results while Mark's getting a web browser for me. And uh, wow, OK, so you can see here that um, doing it both. Basically, a third of you would say you do that. A fifth of you don't have to do LRS, but thanks for learning. If nothing else, you've, ex you've expanded your, uh, your GIS horizon today uh, by learning about some of these things. And um, anyway, some of you want to just stay doing what you're doing, and that's great too. Uh, but uh, thanks so much for, for tuning in today. So just to um, go there, there's uh, one thing I want to show you, fme.ly slash capital S, uh, capital S, uh, lowercase i, g, capital T, I, L, L. So this uh, was just uh, posted on Twitter. Let this letter rep. Hopefully this works. Um, this is uh, from our one of our friends in uh, Norway that's uh, 
doing some multitasking and I guess training his young child in the wonders of LRS uh, <laughs> tonight there in Norway. So I think um, the, I guess it's never uh, never a bad environment for listening to an FME webinar. So with that, I think we're ready to kind of wrap her up, Mark. Yep. We just again want to highlight that our uh, user conference is coming up in June and this is just one example of the myriad of things that will be presented by the excite the amazing users of FME at that event and uh, maybe we can lean on Knut to come and uh, and give us an update on what he's done or certainly we can have a special interest session on linear referencing there. A few other things coming up, we'll be doing our world tour and so on and yes this webinar has been recorded. And you'll get a follow-up email with the links and, of course, the examples will be thrown up there as well. Yes, because someone did ask if that custom transformer, that mild poster thing that you just had, would be available. And, yes, it will be in that yep, workspace. Sure. Yep. So I think, is there anything else? Yeah, we got the free training always uh, coming up uh, on November 19th and 20th. I don't think they get into linear referencing, no. but uh, <laughs> we should do a training thing someday as well based on the uh, incredible. Frankly, I'm amazed at the response to this webinar, and we're really, really pleased about that. So just, uh, I know we only got about, well, less than one minute. Uh, I wanted to just mention a couple of quick things. Somebody asked if this stuff is in the Esri Data Interop extension, which is a subset of FME. The answer is a un, uh, unbridled yes. All the stuff you saw is in there today. Um, another really interesting thing is about continuous versus discrete measures. Um, the idea is, you know, you might have a measure that, that just is an enumeration. This is yeah. gravel, this is gravel. So you shouldn't be interpolating that if you snip. That's Normally right. FME interpolates when we cut and um, we, Mark and I have talked long about being able to identify and measures whether they're continuous or discrete. We don't do that yet, but that's a great improvement. Yeah, and we are planning a, a measure push at some stage. We haven't yes. really um, scheduled that yet. but Which is why this <laughs> webinar is yeah. partly a catalyst for that because we're planning our work for FME 2015. Please, if you can see holes or things, if only we did this, um, you would help you. Fire them into the questions right now. I'm going to be pouring over that spreadsheet uh, of all the responses very carefully together with Mark as we plan a, a linear reference sprint for, for, the, um, for the next year. So I think we're a little bit into overtime. I think we'll call that it. Yep. Um, we'll stand by to uh, answer questions. Uh, the team is still uh, there, so hang around if you want to and ask more. But the rest of you, uh, thanks so much for tuning in. And, and it's so, goodbye from me. Yep. And goodbye from him. That's right. <laughs> so thanks so much, and we'll see you at the World Tour FM User Conference or at the next webinar, whenever that is. Right. So thanks so much. With that, we'll stop the audio, but we'll let you keep on uh, asking questions of our panelists. So goodbye, and thanks again, Knut, for supplying us the motivation for doing this webinar, and Lars Robertson for 14 years ago asking if he could do right. linear 15 years ago. All right. How do I mute this thing? Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>